Welcome to episode 260 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Yeah, well, Rob, every single time I hear you say the episode number, I feel like it can't be that high. It's and it gets higher every time. It's higher every time by one. <laughs> Just keeps incrementing. Yeah, five years, going on you know, 300 as the next big milestone. It's a lot. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the top there, so I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we had this uh, tweet. It was, it was a bit of a, a long thread, actually. So it started with Patricia Oss, uh, we've had on the show twice, I think, mm-hmm. saying, uh, C++ people, do you have an example where const were actually caught a bug? And uh, Taylor Price responded, I'm sure Jason has something here. He's the const expert champ on CPPcast. And like I said, that began a long thread. But I am curious uh, if you ever have encountered a bug that was fixed by uh, Constexper. Well, or caught a bug by Constexper. I mean, definitely, because when I was developing my ARM emulator and doing it all with Constexper test, any any invocation of undefined behavior, like if I uh, executed code that did a left shift by greater than the size of the word, then that would be caught at compile time. So, and some of those things, you know, UBCN can catch, some of them it can't. Address sanitizer, it can catch, some of them it can't. But to know that if the test even compiled, that it did everything I wanted to do without invoking undefined behavior, yeah, definitely caught stuff. Painfully sometimes, it's one (laughs) of the things. uh, Because if, if you get a build error because of a bug, trying to track what caused it can be really painful. Mm. So I ended up, um, this is when I teach classes on this stuff and, and everything. I tell people you have to make sure your tests are compilable both as static asserts and as regular like runtime asserts so that it's possible to build the version that can build so that you can step through it and figure out what happened. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. Joining us today is Slobodan Dimitrovic. Slobodan is a software development consultant and author from Serbia. He specializes in C++ training, technical analysis, and software architecture. He's a highly visible member of the SE European C++ community and a Stack Overflow contributor. Slobodan has gained international experience working as a software consultant in Denmark, Poland, Croatia, China, and the Philippines. He's a maintainer of a website at cppandfriends.com. Slobodan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason and Rob. It's a pleasure to be at your show. I'm looking at the, the list of places you say that you've traveled and worked in, and Denmark, Poland, Croatia are all relatively close together compared to China and Philippines. Kind of curious what took you to the other side over there. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess it was a sequence of events. I was, uh, at the time, not doing C++, actually, I was doing Delphi. Oh, wow. So, huh? a company there found my programs online. They liked it, had me fly over to them and uh, develop a informational system for their companies. Actually, that particular company is now the second biggest IT services provider in the Philippines. Oh, well, that's cool. So, yeah, that one. And the China, actually, at the time I went to China, I was quite deep into C++ world. I was, uh, so I guess C++ gets you places. It it indeed (laughs) does. And it took on from there to Denmark and the rest of the... Europe mainly. So yeah, that was my experience regarding that. I have uh, never been contacted by anyone in China to either do contracting or training or anything, so it's still completely outside of my world. Well, Jason, let's make a few calls and see (laughs) if we can make something about it. We might still have to wait a few months, I think. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) That's right. Okay, well, slow down. We have a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and we'll start talking more about uh, your book and training and stuff like that, okay? Sure. 
All right. So this first one is a blog post on Claire McCray, Claire McRae's blog, who we had on the show, I think, last year, right, Jason? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it was. It feels very recent in my mind, but I know my my timing is all weird. <laughs> right. Well, this is uh, to announce that she and Llewellyn Falco are doing some approval test training courses in September. So if anyone uh, remembers our episode with her, it was all about approval tests, which is kind of a, a different way of doing unit testing. I thought it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's doing training on approval tests. So if you're interested, there is sort of these online workshops that you can sign up for uh, throughout the month of September. I, I definitely suggest people check that out if they're interested at all. Yeah, definitely. Uh, next thing we have is on the NVIDIA developer blog. And this is accelerating standard C++ with GPUs using Studpar. And I don't know if I missed a, a different announcement or if this is just one of the first blog fo- posts I've seen about the NVIDIA HPC SDK. Jason, have you heard about this before? Uh, I feel like it's things that I'm supposed to have heard of, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, but the announcement, I think, is still largely news. Right. Yeah, so this is all, all about using NVIDIA's uh, high-performance C++ SDK, which kind of the big thing about that compared to other options for getting your code to run on GPUs is that it's just standard conformance C++, right? Yeah, if you use the C++ 17 parallel uh, STL uh, constructs, then it's automatic. And I have mm-hmm. to put it in air quotes because there's a few caveats. And that's what this blog post, it does mention some of these caveats, right? Yes. Uh, the main one that stood out to me is that you can't pass a function pointer to a standard algorithm and have it parallelize it because that is a function pointer that was compiled for the native system, not for the mm. GPU. So you have to pass it a function object and it will do the correct code tracing to recompile that function object to be able to run on the GPU side. Uh, So it can be a Lambda or some other, you know, standard library function object type, something that's callable, just not a function pointer. It seems it can't deal with that. Hmm. It's interesting. Seems like something we should maybe uh, invite Bryce back on to to do a full episode about the the C++ SDK. Uh, Yeah. There's one other comment. I would rather. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I knew you meant. One other comment I'd like to make, but then I'd also ask to, uh, like to ask uh, our guest if he has any comments on this. Um, th- that the one of the test cases here, the Lulesh, Lulesh, whatever test case here. Um, huh. Just a second. This was a hydrodynamics mini app developed at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory to stress test compilers and model the expected performance of their full size production hydrodynamics applications. So this test case has been tested with MPI, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, C++, Raha, Cocos, and the uh, NVIDIA solution here that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, Just two comments I'd like to make that I think it goes underappreciated just how much money the federal U.S. federal government spends on pure research on this kind of thing, like the National Laboratory here being funded by the government, yeah. largely. It's also some private funding. And, um, and just if you look at the results here, that it basically is it's almost like magic. It performs almost as well as the hand-rolled stuff. Yeah, performance looks really good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Lots. Yeah. Uh, Slobodan, do you have a chance to, to read through this one? Do you ever do anything with GPUs? No, but, but I've always been fascinated at what that particular hardware is capable of. And I'm glad to see that NVIDIA is, is pushing those SDKs so that we are no longer limited to the, what the standard library has to offer in terms of parallelism and everything. I'm certainly looking forward to exploring this subject in more details. It feels like it's something at some point I have to try, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's like this gap in my knowledge. But, I mean, we can't all be experts on everything for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then this last thing I have is a blog post from the Microsoft Visual C++ blog. 
And uh, this is about C++ code spaces, which you can now get in the private preview on. That's what this blog post is about. Um, I can't remember if we discussed code spaces, but it's something they announced earlier this year at the Microsoft uh, Build Developer Conference. And it's basically uh, a way to kind of host your dev environment online, it seems. Right. Yeah. So, like, you know, it doesn't matter if your machine is configured. You could just launch Visual Studio and connect to this online environment. And I think your your code is actually compiled and run on the online environment instead of act on your actual hardware. That is what I recall. Yeah, yeah, that's what it seems to be. So, yeah, it seems like a pretty cool tool. I think right now they're, they are saying they're targeting, like, C++ console applications, which makes sense that you're not, you know, doing GUI development on the... Uh, virtual environment. <laughs> yeah. I want to do GPU development on it. Then I don't have to upgrade <laughs> my hardware. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, pretty neat idea. Okay, so Slobodan, can we start by uh, you giving our listeners a, a bit of a description of the book that you released recently? Sure. Well, I've been thinking about writing this particular book for quite some time now. Uh, I know what a huge mountain it was to climb when learning C++ for myself many, many years ago. So, And it's a never-ending story. You are always into this, and C++ is so complex. And uh, it's almost like the, like the learning never ends. But what I noticed at that time was just how challenging it can be for beginners to, to start, to get a proper start, to build a proper knowledge backbone and to build from there. So I took the plunge. I talked to many heavyweights in the community and uh, yeah, I decided to write an introductory book which starts with the modern C++, uh, modern C++ guidelines, the language, the standard library and uh, those from C++11 to C++20 standards. So basically, this book is introductory course for people who want to learn. I put years of my experience and uh, good practice that I that I saw was to be conducted in the industry, and I took a plunge. And hopefully, I've contributed to make a fine book for beginners. I don't think we've actually said what the title of the book was yet. Is that right? Yeah, uh, actually, right. So the title is uh, Modern C++ for Absolute Beginners. The working title was a Friendly Introduction to C++ Programming. But at the time, my publisher and I were going, uh, we're discussing about how to name it, and uh, the final uh, title was uh, Modern C++ for Absolute Beginners, and the subtitle is uh, A Friendly Introduction to C++ Programming Language, and Modern uh, C++ 11 to C++ 20 standards. So we ended up with a fairly long title and subtitle, <laughs> but I assure you that the subjects and sections are quite concise and straightforward and to the point. So when you say absolute beginners, do you mean people with no programming experience at all, or do you mean people with programming experience but absolutely no C++ experience? That's a great question. I, I think mainly this book is aimed for people who are strangers to C++. Okay. But I also, as you mentioned it, while writing the book, I thought, well, what about those people who have no experience in programming? whatsoever. So I am hoping that it relates to both of those categories of people. Okay. Um, do you think C++ is a difficult language for beginners to learn? I mean, what, what kind of experience did you bring when, uh, when writing this book? If I was totally honest, I would say yes, definitely, it can be a challenge for people to learn C++. Mm -hmm. Because C++ is a language like no other, like no other language. It's, 
if you have a tool that's capable of shifting bits and getting down to the low level hardware stuff but it's yet yet it's also capable of soaring high with the abstraction mechanisms such as templates and classes then you have a tool which by definition is so complex and how you approach this complexity is I think makes all the difference in the world because I've seen during my my time as a professional software developer I've seen I've seen some approaches that leave leave much to be desired in terms of how to teach C++ to especially to beginners you definitely don't want to teach C with classes because that's often the subject that's brought up in the community hmm. and you don't want to teach the stripped down Java also so finding this delicate balance between the right amount of theory and good practice and what to teach what not to teach yeah that I think that was quite challenging for me and my associate while while we were discussing the subjects that need to be put in the, in the book so yes but the main challenge for me actually was to strike a balance between the theory as we all know I, 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 I'll go so far to say that probably C++ is the most complex language in the world programming language right now but when you think about it if you lay down the foundation the proper way and delegate the more complex stuff to some future books or blogs or or similar things then you have a chance to genuinely have those people interested in the language i've i've heard many times people that are established c++ developers who say after learning the c++ i pretty much left uh, i lose I lost all interest in other languages. <laughs> so that that's a powerful statement to me. And but getting to that point takes some time. Will take some time and will take some effort. So do you, you said you know you're talking about your own journey and learning C plus plus and how it was a steep learning curve. I think earlier. Um, but now your book says that it covers techniques up through C++ 20. So we're curious, is it, uh, do you think C++ is getting easier to learn as the language evolves, or do you think it's getting harder to learn? Again, I'll take the plunge and be uh, quite honest with this. I think the C++ 20 introduces some fairly complex things and stuff okay. <laughs> to put it mildly but uh, I I'm an optimist because this has been my bread and butter for many years and I think it will be adopted industry is slow at adopting new standards sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but when I see things in there are mighty things we were missing for many years in C++ 20 that's definite so Yes, I think it will pick up and uh, be adopted. It was a challenge to include everything, but you can't include everything in a 300 pages book. So it, it, was a, it was a delicate balance of what goes and what not, especially for the beginners. I remember when I was a beginner, so I, I, I made sure that I delegate more complex stuff to some other authors and other developers we don't need to get down into nitty gritty details at this point when we are learning C++. Let's get the basics right and take it from there. So can you give us maybe a high level overview of what topics you did include and what topics you chose to exclude? Sure. The book itself is divided into, I'll say, three parts. The first part deals with the C++ language programming language basics and as always you start with the hello world uh -huh. <laughs> but then you end up I, I remember talking years back with my uh, colleague and fellow peer who was a senior engineer actually he was a principal engineer and 
we then discussed how to bring it up and he started writing this uh, introduction and he ended up doing 15 pages about the hello world application <laughs> so that gives you some perspective of how things can be particularly complex with C++. So I said, okay, nobody wants to learn a language that has 15 pages about Hello World. So how to bring it down? You don't need to go into details how the C out object is created and so on and so on, the operators and overloading. It's a Hello World. Let's just keep it at there. And as we progress to the book, we'll develop on that. Mm -hmm. So the next chapter is is types. Obviously, you need to discuss the fundamental types, then the type modifiers, variables, and from there I uh, describe the operators and the standard input. And this is the part where we had some back and forth discussion. If you are teaching modern C++ to people who never learned the language, should you or should you not teach arrays and row pointers? Mm -hmm. So in this discussion we went back and forth. The consensus in the community is that you should not be teaching raw arrays and raw pointers to people. But then we had another idea. Let's teach it only to discourage the use of these things in modern C++. Okay. So how do you guys feel about this approach? Sounds like an idea. Yeah. Yeah. So we did discuss arrays and we did discuss briefly raw pointers, but only to discourage the use and in favor of other more progressive and constructive things, in, especially in modern C++. So the next chapter when we jumped to strings, automatic type deduction, statements with the divided statements into some sections like selection statements, uh, iteration statements, and this is, this. I'll go back to your question whether this uh, book is suited for the beginners in C++ or beginners in general. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if I discuss all the selection and iteration statements, I guess it will cater to both of these groups. Mm -hmm. So if people who are already uh, familiar with the four statements, they will jump over it, and those that are not will have the opportunity to go into much detail, much more details about this. Oh, so the next chapter would be constants, functions, scope, and lifetime, which is uh, a bit might sound like a science fiction, but I, I, I took every effort to, to bring it down to earth, to discuss in plain words what it is, what's the scope, what's a lot, lifetime, what's the storage, how all these things are intertwined and how they affect each other and so on. Another big discussion was whether to mention new and delete mm -hmm. in favor mm -hmm. of smart pointers. And as before, we said, okay, let's mention that only to discourage the use of it in favor of modern smart pointers. Okay. How much detail do you go in when you're kind of explaining some of these features, but at the same time saying, you know, don't use this though, but use something newer? That's a great question. Uh, much of my effort went into deciding on how to go about solving this issue. I used the just enough theory approach. Mm -hmm. So I, I teach the reader, prospective readers, just the right amount of theory they need to know in order to be able to use this uh, language feature or a standard library feature. So there is a, there are 40 chapters in the book and the book itself is 300 and something pages. So I, I, I think I kept it fairly brief. brief. And after that comes comes the big guns, which is which are classes. And this is but this is, this is actually interesting because I separate classes into two sections, where introductions like uh, 
data members, member functions and access specifiers, constructors, destructors and so on and so on. And then I discuss copy constructors, move constructors, move assignments and so on and so on, destructors. And then I put inheritance and polymorphism into a separate section, also under classes. Okay. So I felt that I should put another chapter in between these two, with, which would be only exercises. So let's get mm. that right. Let's get the basics right. Let's learn how to work with data members, with member functions, with visibility. Let's get those correctly. Well, the way you just said, oh, and then I covered move constructors, and now we've, we just had Nikolai uh, Yositas on, right, and talked about how he's, what, writing a 400-page book or something on move semantics. So I was just kind of curious how you uh, kind of covered that topic without going super deep into it. It was quite challenging, to be honest. <laughs> it was quite challenging. So... What I used was, okay, let's put it this way. I'll teach you the copy constructor basics and copy assignment basics. And I'll try my best to teach you the move constructor basics and the move assignment basics. Mm -hmm. If I was going to go into every detail about these particular mechanisms in the C++, as you mentioned, well, that's, that's a book in its own right. So it was challenging. I also had this question whether I covered everything. What if did I did did I leave out too much details? Did I put too much detail? So mm -hmm. yeah, it could it was a balancing act, I should say. I'm sure. But uh, these particular topics are covered in the constructors section of the classes chapter. So, well, they start from page 104 and end up with the page 120. So, I felt the need to keep it briefly because we don't want to scare the, 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 the beginners with nitty-gritty details. I feel uh, when I am teaching, and sometimes if I'm just trying to keep something high level and I'll be like, okay, well, here's a string. And depending on, on the particular class that I'm teaching and the students, and inevitably I'll get some student that goes, well, that's not a string, that's a character array. And yes, okay. So then you, you, you something that sh sounds so incredibly simple, just a character string literal in C++, is actually a string array that decays to a pointer that calls the uh, implicit conversion for standard string. And then you've just spent an hour of the class digging into this if it's something the students are interested in. I just, I'm assuming you had, had to approach similar topics on this book as well. Exactly. The rabbit hole is so deep with particular, <laughs> almost every subject in C++, but if you strike a balance, when I always have to remind myself, you are writing this book for absolute beginners. Yeah. So you're not catering to the highly ranked Stack Overflow contributors. So <laughs> you you need to keep this right balance. We, with all due respect, most of them are my, my personal best friends, Those some of those Stack Overflow contributors. Oh. But I always get to, I, I'm also keen to contribute to Stack Overflow and everything, but I needed to have this in back of my head. These are beginners. Don't go into every nitty gritty details. You, you'll just chase them away. So keep it simple, but provide enough theory so that they get genuinely interested in the language. So yeah, it was a challenge for me as well. We talked uh when we first introduced you about your uh, bio and, and doing training at uh, various companies and in various countries, uh, mm -hmm. it was a lot of that training to, you know, experienced programmers who are completely new to C++? Uh, I guess it was 50-50. Okay. In some parts, there are people, there were employees who were absolutely, absolute strangers to C++. 
and in other other companies where I was, for example, moving some legacy code to the new compilers, there were seasoned, established, amazing bunch of people, amazing developers. But at that point, they were just starting to get into the modern C++ techniques and migrating all their uh, code and also habits to the new C++. So I remember one particular uh, discussion uh, regarding C++ 17. They wanted to switch to the C++ 17 because there was a the string view and everything. Mm. But mm. then there was a back and forth discussion whether this is a good enough reason to move to this. Why not move to the C++ 14 instead of C++ 17? So, yeah, that was... Uh, I also learned a lot there, so... What was the conclusion? Did they go all the way to 17? Uh, actually, this COVID situation struck, so I'm not... Uh, I had to return to home, so I'm not familiar with what, what the uh, final decision was. But it, it was a good experience. I also, I also learned a lot from some of the... You know how it is with C++. When you see a framework, you immediately know if it's, if it's elegant or not. Right. Jason... Do you agree with me on this one? I agree. I agree. that You you get an immediate gut feeling of, oh, well, this was designed originally in C, or this hasn't been updated in 20 years, or, oh, I can see what they went here. This feels elegant and clean and modern, and I know how to expect this to work. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I was fortunate enough while doing my work to be exposed to some, some of the most elegant, beautiful, elegant C++ framework I've ever seen in my life. So I'm I'm forever grateful to those companies and those peoples who gave me the opportunity to to give my contribution and to also learn from them. So it was a it was an amazing experience for me. I can't go into details, but sure. I think you are probably interacting with their software as we speak right now. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. So that was uh, if you see. But getting to that point takes takes time, takes effort, and my intent with this book was to get let's get the basics right. Right. Let me just show you how beautiful this world of C plus plus can be, and how rewarding it is. It, it's a constant learning. It, it's not to mention that the pay is also good. <laughs> it gets you places. <laughs> certainly helps so at any point in the book do you say you know make a, a note like well this topic is a potential rabbit hole something for you to investigate later or anything like that I have a few sentences that put it mildly yes <laughs> they discuss that but I one needs to maintain a, a professional tone and so one also needs to be reminded that this goes out to the market so it was a balancing act also on that side but yes i do right. i certainly do have a few sentences that describe just how some pitfalls potential pitfalls you can go into or some don't don't go into that direction for now. Let's leave it. Let's delegate that for some other times and so on. And uh, yes, I briefly also touch on the subject of templates in okay. my book. Inheritance, uh, enumerations, and I also made sure to cover each section with a lot of exercises mm -hmm. that build on in complexity. So let's start with the basic. Let's initialize this variable. Let's initialize two variables and then build it and grow into complexity from there, starting with the hello world and so on and so on. But, yeah, now that I see, it's a lot of subjects. I also covered the basics of the standard library. And that's also rabbit hole of its own, so you need to be careful. It's a vast universe, but for a beginner, what is it that a beginner is likely to benefit from the standard library at this point while learning the language. So mm -hmm. those were some of my guidelines in writing this 
second chapter. <clears throat> so there's a lot of stuff, yeah. C plus, well, what C plus plus twenty topics did you end up covering? I covered modules, modules, concepts, lambda templates, some of the attributes like likely and unlikely ranges, coroutines, STD span, and uh, mathematical constants. Oh well, that's that's a pretty wide wow. coverage of it. Yeah. Thanks. So did you? Uh, I mean, things like modules are hard to test right now because we don't have, I don't think, any one compiler that's fully conformant. Um, how did you, uh, are you, well, maybe maybe I'll phrase this a different way. Are you nervous that your code samples won't work? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly was at the time of the writing. Uh, I am now, this was the most challenging part, actually, in my book, writing okay. uh so a lot of research and research had to go into it. At the time, none of the compilers, I believe it's the case also now, none of the compilers fully implemented the support for C++ 20. Right. So what you end up is this. You go through the entire what's existing on the net, and then you go from the GCC trunk, and you hope that it will work. <laughs> it didn't at the time, but you hold your fingers crossed and give enough theoretical introduction into the concepts of this particular standard. And I, and I also emphasize that at the time of the writing, uh, compilers did not fully implement the C++ 20 standards, but uh, on it, the C++ 20 uh, section, yeah, it's scary in terms of that <laughs> whether it will work or not work, but the theory was certainly there. And uh, established examples from some of the other sources. So I, I kept from pages 278 to 292. Those are the C++ 20. Okay. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, that in C++ there's kind of an aspect of uh, continually learning new things. Uh, what did you learn while writing this book? That's a great question. Well, do, while doing the research, I've certainly solidified my knowledge backbone because mm -hmm. it's a good thing if you work as a professional C++ developer to go back to the basics. So while writing this book, I also benefited in, in doing the research. So I believe every developer has this point where he touches some complex things and then goes back to basics to okay let's not it's a good thing because it keeps you grounded on the earth and also keeps you cautious about not going into not how not to get beaten by the complexity mm -hmm. so right. i think it benefited me in terms that i and more careful not to write code that my fellow peers will not understand in the future or, or or make it less easy to maintain that particular code so yeah in that in that regard i also benefited from writing this book so i mean short of you know our listeners going out and writing their own books on beginning c++ do you have any advice for how we can, you know, think about this this topic of writing code that's uh, functional but still readable and maintainable by people who don't necessarily know all the details? Sure. My advice would be you don't need to know every nitty-gritty details in C++ in order to be a successful developer or in order to successfully learn the language. Okay. You don't need to go into every nitty-gritty details, whether it's a language or the standard library. Take from the language what you need at that point and then build on that foundation. Don't be, don't be intimidated by the language. It's a beautiful product of the human intellect. It certainly was for me and it can be scary at times, but it's so rewarding when, when you get the basics right and then build from that point. So, yeah, that would be my advice. Don't get beaten by the complexity. 
there is beauty and elegance in simplicity often. So that's something to to consider probably. Okay. Uh, sometimes, and you, since you mentioned uh, with, that you said when you're talking about classes that you mentioned move constructors, I'm going to bring it back to that again just because mm -hmm. it's a good illustration in my mind. I find that it's hard to mention move constructors without mentioning our value references, but our value references don't make a whole lot of sense unless you understand why they exist. And I find that this, this circular topic... Did you have circular topics in the book that you had to then somehow unravel for your readers? Well, uh, it's almost not a coincidence that you bring up this air value thing. Yes, I wanted to make sure, look, for the new reader, my advice was, look, it's even at this point somewhat of a mystery to me. So let's not get into this nitty-gritty details about here is the L value for now I think it is good for you to think that it is something that can be placed on the left hand side of an assignment operator mm -hmm. and this is the R value for now let's just assume that it's something that can be placed on the right hand side of the operator now that you are mentioning yeah that's out of all the constructors subjects this one is the longest it's three pages yeah some put some some authors write whole books on it but right it was just it was just the main thing that came to mind i'm assuming there's probably other topics in a book like this also where it's difficult to introduce something without having uh introduced a whole vocabulary first Sure. One particular example were the, the smart pointers. Mm. About that subject, I felt the need to first introduce the reader to the language basics, raw pointers, and classes. And only then should I introduce the reader to the smart pointers. Because, and scopes, and so on and so on. It would be difficult for me to explain the, me the mechanics behind the smart pointers for uh, if you if the reader is not uh, introduced properly into scope classes destructors and so on and so on so yeah that that particular subject was was challenging where where to put it in sequence in the book right. did you then also now that you're talking about pointers have to go into the difference between the heap and the stack and and why it matters to the readers I covered that in the in the chapter where I dis discuss scope, lifetime, automatic storage, dynamic storage, and so on. Yes, I have a, I have a chapter dedicated exactly to these things, the difference between the automatic and dynamic storage, and so on. Especially uh, challenging things with, particularly in C++, is the terminology. Mm -hmm. and the theory so what's the duration what's the duration how how do you explain that to to a beginner what's uh automatic storage duration those these terminology can get in the way but i took every effort i could to to bring it down to the earth and explain to the reader in the best way that i was capable of at the time it does sound like you, you covered an amazing amount of topics in, what did you say, 300, 400 pages? 300 and something pages, yes. 300 something, thank you, okay. Jason. And it sounds thank like you, you covered a lot. It sounds impressive. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That's certainly motivation for me, and uh, it, it, a lot of work went to it, but I, I think it will, it will be interested to the, interesting to the readers, and it will pay off, yes. So is the book... Uh, Available in print, digital, both? Yes, the book is available in electronic and printed formats on APRES and Amazon sites. Okay, and we'll definitely have links to that. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, one question I had is, do you have any idea how, you know, the kind of curriculum you put forward in the book compares to what 
uh, new programmers are learning in university these days that are you know taking C++ classes? Well, that 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 is a subject uh, more often than not a touchy subject. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, I've seen progress in the academic world where where the progress has been made and is being made. For quite some time, uh, some of the universities were teaching uh, C with classes mm -hmm. and teaching that C++ is nothing but a tool for solving more or less trivial mathematical problems. Uh, that, in my opinion, is not the way forward. But I've seen recently, and I also talked to a few universities, that things are improving and which is a good thing always mm -hmm. c++ is definitely not a tool for solving mat trivial mathematical problems and if you end up doing nothing but chasing array elements up and down and chasing binary trees or whatnot well then you are missing much of this you need to teach the language and the, the good programming practices not not contain yourself or focus yourself only on solving trivial mathematical problems. It, that's just not what this language or any other language is meant for, for that right. particular. Mm -hmm. But yes, things are improving. And also seeing colleges and universities wanting to having uh, guest lectures, especially from the C++ world, so that's a good thing. Yeah, that's good. Jason, you have anything else? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, well, Slobodan, is there anything else uh, you wanted to go over with us that we haven't already covered with the book? Well, no, I would like to ask you how do you feel about these conferences going uh, online? What's, what are your thoughts about it? So I, I take the CPP I know that in Berlin they are holding uh, online conferences. I'm not sure what's happening to the CPPCon. Uh, so CPPCon is all online now. Yeah. Meeting C++ is still planning to be a hybrid conference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think every other conference at this point now has either been canceled or moved online. I have not yet attended one of the online conferences, so I don't feel like I can give a a really strong opinion on it personally. Yeah, looking forward to CBBCon. Uh, it's almost exactly a month away, but I mean, we heard good things from the people who attended CPP on mm -hmm. C virtually. Yes. Yeah. And I did buy my tickets to CPPCon, ticket mm -hmm. to CBBCon, so I will be attending that one virtually. Um, I imagine, you know, bumping into people in the halls during the conference will definitely be different. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, I guess I, I always like to be on the on the field. I always like to mingle with people and mm -hmm. yeah. But we all need to adjust in this particular moment. I guess it will be over, and things will be back to as they were. Oh, yours open. <laughs> yeah, eventually. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today, Slobodan. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. Talking to you, I've always been a great admirer of Jason's and your work, Rob. So it was a pleasure for the opportunity to be able to be on your cast. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for coming on. Okay, thank you.